Where you wind up depends on which road you're going to take, right? In other words, you cannot go south from here and, and expect to end up in New York City. Won't work. You cannot go east from here and wind up at the Mississippi River. Now, you could, as some people try to do, but you could circumvent the globe, but using the roads which are in place now, it would be impossible to go south and end up in New York City. Well, this is true in the physical realm. It is also true in the spiritual realm. There are roads. And everyone is on a spiritual journey as they travel through life. It is a spiritual journey. God made us spiritual beings. Whether it's religious or not, we travel a spiritual path. And every day we each make decisions and choices which affect the direction that we're headed. So where you wind up in eternity will be determined, is predicated on the road you take here on earth. The choices and the decisions you make. It is impossible to take the wrong road and go to heaven. And it is impossible to take the right road and go to hell. What you do while in this world, while we live, will determine forever where you're going to spend forever. After all, we are all surrounded by death. You know, we, a couple years ago, in one of our churches that we pastored, on the same day, there was a birth in the church, as well as one of the saints of the church passed away, all in the same day. So we're surrounded by death, the moment we're born into this world. Loved ones pass away. Friends will pass away. And deep inside, we know it will happen to us someday as well. And that shouldn't surprise any of us. Because what do we say in America? What are the only two things that are guaranteed in America? Death and taxes. Taxes isn't a guarantee either. But death is. And the reality is, when someone dies, we often say, well, they're in a better place, don't we? When someone dies, if it's a friend, if it's a loved one, we often say they're in a better place. Are they really, though? Are they really in a better place? Well, that depends on which road they traveled while they were here on this earthly sod. We're entering the last section of the Sermon on the Mount. And today we're in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, where Jesus is speaking about there's only two roads. You got two choices. And as we will finish up here over the next few weeks on the Sermon on the Mount, the end of the chapter here is all about contrasting the saved compared to the unsaved. And Jesus is saying there's two ways. Each with its own beginning, each with its own end. One way is heavenly traveled, the other is less traveled. Which then poses a question for us all, where are you in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual sojourn? Which path are you on? Are you headed in the right direction? 
Because Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who will go in it by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. For wide is the gate. So this gate represents the beginning to the way. It's the beginning of the way that leads to destruction. Just like coming into the state of New Jersey. It was one of the things we had to adjust to in moving here. It's the only state I've been a part of that you got to pay to come in and you got to pay to leave. But you got to come in. You got to go through the gate. Now, there are other ways on into the state where you don't have to go through a toll road. But it's described as wide, which allows, in other words, many people, many will enter with no sacrifice or no restrictions on their part. In other words, it doesn't require giving up anything. One is allowed to bring along whatever baggage they desire. And the reality is there is no limit as to the bags, the count number of bags you would check. Sherry and Travis are getting ready to fly back to see family here at the end of the month. And so now we're starting to think, well, how many bags can you take? Well, you can check one bag. You've got to pay for it. But you can have one carry-on, one purse. So Travis is like, okay, I can have a, this and another bag. And I said, well, no, you, well, yeah, if you want to have a purse. So he's trying to figure out whether he wants to take a purse along. <laughs> so he can carry more stuff on. And the reality is there is no limit how many bags you can check. Your bags could be filled with materialism, prejudices, hatred, unforgiving spirit, and literally believe whatever one wants to believe. That's what the wide gate provides. And Jesus says, therefore, this gate is chosen by many people because there's no restrictions. There's no restrictions concerning belief and behavior. And as one commentary I read said, it opens the way to the path of least resistance. Though it starts out that way, the path of least resistance, the reality is it doesn't end up that way though. So as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is always putting before us a contrast to worldly living versus kingdom living. I like how Dr. John MacArthur said it when it comes to this contrasting that Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. He said it's a contrast between divine righteousness and human righteousness righteousness between divine religion and human religion between the true religion Christ alone versus false religion and thousands of man-made religions so it's about grace versus works it's about living life in the flesh contrasted to living life in the Holy Spirit as a child of God. And that's what's left in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Is Like I said, contrasting the saved versus the unsaved. But there are other areas in Scripture too we can learn and see a very vivid contrast of what it means to live between a wide path of worldly living and a narrow path of kingdom living. All you got to do is go into Galatians 5, 19 through 26. 
In verses 19 through 21, it shows us the life that is taking the wide gate. And Paul says, this is that life. Now the works of the flesh, which leads to destruction, are evident, which are idolatry, fornication. What's fornication? Fornication is sex outside marriage. Right? But then he goes on to say, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The way that leads to destruction is broad because it allows any behavior that the flesh can come up with, that the flesh desires. There's no need for reformation. There's no need to change one's lifestyle. And all we got to do is look around. Look around at what's happening. It seems like every day more and more wicked behavior is becoming more and more permissible. And many people like this path. They think they're free. They believe they're open-minded. They view themselves as tolerant of others in this same way. And yet Jesus says, you're living a life that leads to destruction. Now the life taking the narrow path, it says, is beginning at verse 22 in Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit, which leads to life, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he goes on to say, against such there is no law. Are those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, Paul says, then let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, proud, provoking one another, envying one another. That's what the narrow road is. That's what the narrow gate is. The way that leads to true joy, to a true joyous life, is difficult. It's hard. Because it requires a righteousness that exceeds that of many religious people, Jesus said back in Matthew 5.20. And so that narrow gate that Jesus is talking about literally calls, if you want to enter through that narrow gate, it calls for you to change in who we are, literally. As Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 5, he said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And because of that difficulty, many choose not to travel its path. Why? Because they think it's confining. Because they think it's narrow-minded. They think it's intolerant. And they think it's a bunch of don'ts. And yet, Jesus says this narrow gate, this difficult path, that's what leads to life. But yet, Jesus said there are very few who find it. As I was 
reading and studying and preparing for this message, I was reading J. Vernon McGee's commentary on this. And he said the wide and the narrow gate, he gave it a different, he gave it an analogy I'd never thought about. But he said the wide and the narrow gate is like a funnel. Wide is the gate. How much can you get in the top of this funnel? A lot, right? But narrow is the gate that leads to life. How much can you get through here? Not much. In fact, probably one at a time. But he said, it's like a funnel. If you enter the funnel at the broad end, which is easy, it keeps narrowing down until you come to death, destruction, and hell. There's, there's a lot of least resistance here. But right here is where the resistance starts to pick up, which ends up leading to death, destruction, and hell. But you can enter the funnel at the narrow part up here, which is really hard. And as one lives their life, and where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and as he said in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life, and not just life, but have life what? More abundantly. So Jesus said, repent and become the repent and the kingdom is near. So in order to get into this narrow gate, you gotta repent. To get into here, you don't. But that leads to destruction. This leads to life. And here's the reality that goes along with the funnel analogy. It starts out, it's narrow, it's hard to get in. But the longer one walks with Christ on this earthly sod, the wider the funnel gets, signifying it gets better. Not easier, but it gets better day by day. Until one day, it says in Revelation 21, starting at verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Tabernacle of God is Jesus Christ. But the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. But now listen to verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. See? It's going to get better. It's going to get bigger. That's the abundant life. That's what the end of a hard, narrow road for a child of God looks like. So then the question is, is that you? Is that me? Which path are we on? A letter was written to the Melbourne Daily Paper after a Billy Graham crusade many, many years ago. And this is what the letter said. It said, after hearing Dr. Billy Graham on the air, viewing him on TV and reading reports and letters concerning him and his mission, I'm heartedly sick of the type of religion that insists my soul and everyone else's need saving, whatever that means. I have never felt that I was lost, nor do I feel that I daily wallow in the mire of sin although repetitive preaching insists that I do. Give me a practical religion that teaches gentleness and tolerance, that acknowledges no barriers of color or creed, that remembers the age and teaches children of goodness and not sin. 
if in order to save my soul, I must accept such a philosophy as I have recently heard preached by him, I prefer to remain forever damned. And damned he shall be by his own doing. It's a choice. See, the reality is the only people in hell are the ones who chose the wide gate. It's not God's doing. It's your doing. It's your choice. You either go through the wide gate, which leads to death and destruction, or you go through the narrow gate, which is hard. And you can't get in this gate until you go through Jesus Christ. In order to get, we always want to skip over Friday and Saturday and go right to Sunday, don't we? But you can't. We try, we try to circumvent the process. We try to make it easy. And yet Jesus is saying the choice is yours. He says you've got to choose. Even Joshua reminded the nation of Israel. He said, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day. I'm going to paraphrase Joshua 24 for you. Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your family who have lived in this area or the gods of the United States of America whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you can fill that in wherever you're living. And that's exactly what Peter declared in Acts 2.38. He said, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive, what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Which road are you on? Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. Elsewhere, he says, I am the door, John 10.9. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Have you? Will you? Which path are you on today? Romans 10, 8 through 13 says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preached that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. You see, the ones going through the wide gate, which leads to destruction, they're not calling on God. They are their God. But those who go through the narrow gate which leads to an abundant life in Jesus Christ, they're calling on God because they know that they sinned against God. Oswald Chambers said this, both nations and ind individuals have tried Christianity and abandoned it because it has been found too difficult but no man has ever gone through the crisis of deliberately making Jesus Lord and found him to be a failure. So the choice is yours. Which path are you on? The one among the few? Or the one among the many? 
Because the one among the few, it's difficult. It's hard. Just like the song you sang. But the one among the many, it's easy. It looks good, but it leads to destruction. Will you join me in prayer? Our heavenly and most merciful Father. Father, these words today that have been preached and that have been read might have hit a nerve on some. I hope it hit a nerve on all of us. Because Lord, we need to hear it. We need to remember it. We need to know why it is we do what we do. Why we hold the communion table so relevant in our walks. Why we hold the cross so relevant in our walk. Knowing what was done on our behalf. Because Father, I don't want to see anybody come to the end. And when they're standing before you on their judgment day, and they say, we prophesied in your name, we fed the hungry, we fed the poor, we did this, we did that. And you say to them, I don't know you. Get away from me. Father, I'm not going to let that happen. Not from what I preach. And no church in this community, in this county, in this state, or in this world should be preaching anything other than Jesus Christ crucified. Jesus Christ resurrected. Because, Father, if, they're, if it's being done, they're being led astray. They're being led to the life of destruction. We're seeing it right before our eyes. And yet we stand back and say nothing. But like Joshua stood before the nation of Israel, choose this day who you will serve. Because, Father, we know we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Nobody in here, Father, our church experienced it in the last couple of weeks. Death, unexpectedly. But, Father, all of us could drop dead right now. Are we ready to stand before you? When we die, will our bodies be separated absent from the body and present with you, like we read in Revelations, will we get to see that? Only if we've repented. But Father, if we haven't repented, we don't get to look upon your face. Then we're going to be told to get away. So Father, wherever we are in our walk with you, Father, that we would turn to you that we would confess, we would repent, and we would believe in our hearts and confess with our tongue that Jesus Christ is Savior, Lord of kings, King of kings, and Lord of lords. And that we would live the life as your ambassadors, as the salt and the light in this very community where we work, where we live, where we play. Father, to you be the glory and the honor every day, all day. And we ask this in the blessed name of Christ. Amen.